So I always go back to first principles. Whenever, whenever I read a story where the aliens are completely incomprehensible, I, I take a step back and think, okay, we live on a planet with some really weird creatures on it. Like, go look at some insects. Go look at some deep sea creatures. We all operate off the same basic requirements for energy, reproduction, uh, social contact, if it's a social species of some sort. And, you know, people say, well, it's, you know, how would you even be able to communicate with this, this completely other creature? I can communicate with my dog. <laughs> you know, I can communicate with an, a reptile to a degree. You know, I understand the basic stimuli that's going, stimuli that's going on. So I don't think that unless we're talking about aliens that are, you know, energy beings or something that's just completely removed from the physical plane. So as long as they're part of the physical plane, as long as they're physical creatures, I think that we can understand those basic urges and requirements. What is up, everybody? You're listening to episode 54 of SFF Addicts. I'm your host, Adrian M. Gibson, and welcome to your weekly dive into the world of science fiction, fantasy, and writing craft. Joining me as always is my co-host, the Chewy to my Han Solo, the Joker to my Commander Shepard, my dear MJ Kuhn. How are you? I am doing fantastic. How are you doing today? Doing very well. Thank you. A quick note for everyone out there listening or watching, the official SFF Addicts Patreon and merch store are live, so check the links in the description to support what we do here. Also, don't forget to rate and review the podcast on your favorite podcast app and subscribe to the Fanfighter YouTube channel where this and every other episode of the show is available in full video. And you can also support MJ by picking up her book, Among Thieves. If you like swearing, if you like thieves and found family and all that I fun stuff. I love your blurb. If you yeah. like swearing, that's the first <laughs> if thing. You like, if that's the first thing. If <laughs> you, you like Fox and you like Pick heists, <laughs> you go for it. Um, and now joining us once again is Christopher Paolini, author of To Sleep in a Sea of Stars, The Inheritance Cycle, and the newly released Fractal Noise. Welcome back, Christopher. How are you? My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Uh, an absolute pleasure to have you back. And a heads up, this is part two of our two-part chat with Christopher, so I recommend checking out part one to get to know him better. But today, we're getting extraterrestrial with a mini masterclass on aliens and first contact. So to start things off... I want to ask you, this is kind of like a general question, but like, why do you believe humans are innately fascinated by the concept of aliens and how might this play into our fascination with things like intelligent life or our arrogant humanism? I mean, I think it's, it's deeply related to the question of why are we here? Mm -hmm. And we don't necessarily have an answer that satisfies everyone. And the fact that we, uh, you know, came into being on this planet, uh, I think raises the question, can this happen elsewhere? Mm. Uh, Especially since we don't have any other sentient, self-aware creatures that we can communicate with on the planet at the moment. Um, The crazy thing is we know there were a number of other species of humans, like Neanderthals, uh, that we did coexist with at one point, but we don't have any now. And so... Mm. We have no one to talk to but ourselves. Uh, <laughs> I think uh, it, it's it's a both terrifying prospect and a deeply appealing one um, that we might find someone else in the cosmos to talk to. And of course, it would answer a lot of questions about, you know, biology and chemistry and physics to know if life could evolve or has evolved somewhere else. Mm, true. Yeah. yeah. And I'm curious because I know it's been uh, even for people that aren't uh, – deeply embedded in the world of sci-fi, uh, as as, you know, we and our audience are, (laughs) um, (laughs) it's kind of been in the zeitgeist lately because of the like UFOs and stuff that have been found and flying around, right. That have been talked about. I, I'm just curious about your take on that. Do you feel like this is something real that's happening? Is this just a distraction? Like what, what's your take on the UFOs over Michigan and stuff? (laughs) Deeply, 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 deeply skeptical (laughs) that that we we live in a world where everyone now has essentially an HD or better camera Mm -hmm. in their pocket. 
and nobody's getting clear, proper footage of these aliens. No, no, come on. I mean, we literally have billions of people with 4K cameras in their pocket 24-7, and no one can give us clear, proper footage of these aliens. Um, the other thing is, is, you know, having done a lot of research into physics for my sci-fi, it unfortunately gets very depressing because you to, to some degree because you keep thinking well it'd be fun if we could do xyz and mm -hmm. physics says no conservation <laughs> of energy says no now that's not to say we won't discover you know whole new branches of physics or whole new possibilities right. yeah. that we're currently unaware of and and we hope that's the case because that will open doors that we are, cur are currently closed especially when it comes to travel but if if the speed of light continues to remain as the ultimate speed barrier, that doesn't preclude colonizing the galaxy. Um, I think I saw some figures that even moving slower than light within 10,000 years, humans could essentially spread across the whole Milky Way. But it makes it really, really, really hard. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, aliens, A, would first have to know that we even exist, which means they would have had to been watching us, which implies either they decided the dinosaurs were useful to watch and decided to come visit the dinosaurs <laughs> because that's the light that would have been reaching them, or they have FTL um, sensors, mm -hmm. and that's just something we don't have any evidence for, unfortunately. Yeah, and and nobody wants to just like observe Michigan. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> well, so rude. You know, I'll, I'll actually, <laughs> yeah, but you know, the flip side is that if. If we found a planet with alien life, we would probably be entranced watching the most mundane things true, on that planet. True. So, so there is that. And in fact, I've I've seen people who argue about some of these Hollywood films where you know, like Independence Day and stuff. It's like, why would aliens come here to take our resources when any resource you could want is available in far greater quantity in space, or like right? An, Whether an it's water, or, or go, exactly. Yeah. And actually, you know what the answer is. The answer is, if life is as rare as we think it is, they come here for the life. That's the rare resource. It's the biological material on this planet. It's the animals. It's the people. Because yeah. you can't find that anywhere else. They're going to turn us into a So they are coming to snatch zoo. our bodies. Right? They're coming for <laughs> <Yeah>. us. <laughs> well, on the, speaking of Independence Day, that hot, sweet action film from the 90s. <laughs> That was kind of like my introduction. I had this like really fucked up like duality <laughs> of like Independence Day on one hand and Carl Sagan's Contact, the book. Oh, yeah. On the other hand. Oh, yeah. And so it was like these two really disparate things where one's like really into the science. The other one's like, hey, you like disasters. You like explosions? <laughs> yeah, let's do this. So I'm curious, do you remember the first story or movie or TV show that you read or watched or experienced that addressed – this concept of first contact and or aliens and you were just kind yeah of like, it was star trek oh nice it was star trek it was the orig original series star trek actually so, so <laughs> my my dad was a huge is a huge star trek fan and he kind of introduced me to star trek a little backwards so he started because next generation was airing when i was a kid right so he started with a next generation episode mm. and it was if if anyone's seen next generation you'll know this episode it was darmok and jalad <gasps> With Dude. yes, which is <laughs> perfect for me because it was all about language, stories, and mm. first contact with an alien. And then um, my dad said, "Well, we need to see the original series." And then we went back <laughs> and watched um, the original series, and then worked our way up to Next Generation and yeah. DS Nine. Um, but no, it was it was Darmok and Jalad at Tanagra, and the walls fell. So my brother, my oldest brother, is a huge Trekkie, and he just kind of like forced it upon me, and was like. <laughs> Sure. Uh, you know. that, now that said, that said, I remember seeing the trailer for Independence Day in the theater and as a kid looking at my parents and saying with almost religious fervor, we have we to see this it. movie in the theater. <laughs> and I don't think kids nowadays necessarily understand how good that movie was in the theater. It like was so good. It was, it was great. <laughs> and it still is superb. Yeah, I agree. Don't I mean, don't bother. I mean, don't bother with the 14, sequel, but like the original is no, no. Yeah, yeah. F you're 14 years old in a dark theater in Montana, listening to Bill Pullman deliver that Fourth of July <laughs> rousing speech to go kick the aliens off the planet. And boy, boy, it hits hard. Dude, it's like I'm, I'm Canadian. ready to fight God. Yeah. It's like I'm Canadian, and even I was like enraptured by that. I'm just like, you know, it's like Canada Day is like three days before. 
You know, I'm all up and <laughs> there. You go. You can pretend. You can play too, Adrian. Exactly. You're invited. <laughs> just in my head, I'm just like first of July. <laughs> right. Yeah. Exactly. You just alter the line. <laughs> Oh man. And so with with that episode of Star Trek and and you going through the series with your dad, I imagine it was super impactful to just be able to experience that with him. It's like him sharing something that he really loves yeah. with his son. Um how did it impact you cuz you brought up this like thing about language and communication? How did how did that kind of make you think about like this is what science fiction can do? But then also, how did watching Star Trek and kind of building upon your sort of alien repertoire affect your perception of, of our place in the universe? I mean, I'm hardly the first person to say this, but the optimism, the intellectualism at times um, of especially early Star Trek all had a big influence on me. I mean, a lot of, a lot of original series Star Trek has deep roots in classical literature, whether it's Shakespeare or, you know, Moby Dick. And it really sunk into me. And, and, and heck, um, my, my wife actually hadn't seen the original series and I rewatched it with her, mm-hmm. um, recently and it still works. It's the, the writing is good. The, the sets are cheap, but the writing is good. Beautifully uh, most of the time we'll, 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 we'll ignore <laughs> Spock's brain. Um, <laughs> and in fact, in, in Inheritance, in, in my fourth book, there's a scene where Aragon and Saphira are flying through this big storm on the way to this island, and they get swept up in the storm, and they see the curvature of the Earth, uh, which is based on a real incident, by the way, that happened to a hang glider in China. And we know it's real because she was wearing a GPS tracker, and they were able to actually track her going up in this cumulonimbus cloud. Wow. Um, but that, that episode was directly inspired by um, uh, the original series episode where... <laughs> For the world is hollow and I have touched the sky, um, where these people are living inside a hollow asteroid and don't realize that they're in a hollow, hollow mm-hmm. asteroid. Um, lots, of, lots of little things like that. Um, but overall, I think the optimism was infectious. And even if Star Trek doesn't actually make any sense economically um, or even psychologically at times, <laughs> mm-hmm. because... Um, Humans have been pretty much the same for, I mean, humans have been anatomically modern for about 230,000 years. Yeah. In 300 years, we are going to be the same squabbling mess of <laughs> people that we are now. Um, but that said, it's good to have something to strive for. It's yeah. good to have a goal, even if we can't achieve it. Yeah. And regardless, the aliens are going to come snatch us up. So. <laughs> and then there we go with the optimism adrian <laughs> I'm all, that's the optimistic part they're gonna snatch us up and is it oh they're gonna take squabbling. us to, to their yeah. wonderful alien spaceships yeah. um well speaking of aliens again <laughs> and first contact specifically what do you think about that is such compelling story fodder there are there are many stories and they're all so radically different mm. uh that feature that that first contact uh, experience. Well, I mean, it's the unknown. And as you said, there's so many stories that deal with it because it could play out in so many different ways. Uh, unfortunately, we have a lot of examples of, um, you know, one group of humans meeting other groups of humans who are mm-hmm. less technologically advanced, and it does not usually go very well for the less technologically advanced. Yeah. So uh, I think we, we rightly have a lot of fear. Um, I am not a utopianist or a massive optimist because my feeling is that any species that manages to climb to the top of the food chain and survive all the pressures of evolution and just general survival in the universe uh, is going to be like us in some ways is going to be ruthless when they need to be ruthless Mm -hmm. and and probably the most terrifying creature intellectually if nothing else on their planet so hopefully the very thing that makes it hard to explore space, it will also be a protective thing. You know, even if we do discover an alien civilization a thousand light years away, they're a thousand light years away and we can't really communicate with them. They can't really communicate with us. The most dangerous thing though, um, is what's called a relativistic missile. And there is no defense against this unless we have FTL, which is some alien species sees the earth, you know, back when the dinosaurs were around or something. And they say, you know what? Looks like intelligent life might evolve there. And they strap a whole bunch of rockets onto an asteroid or something and accelerate it to a large percentage of the speed of light. 
and aim it at where the earth is going to be when that gets to the solar system. Mm -hmm. And you can't block something that fast. And what's worse is you can't even see it coming until it's too close. And uh, anything that hits that fast um, is much more devastating than the worst explosive you could even think of because, you know, the speed adds to the mass and mm -hmm. it's it's a big bat of boom. So um, <laughs> that's I know that's something people are concerned about theoretically, like, well, you know, if there were a hostile species out there, um, that could be very well be what they're doing. Mm -hmm. To basically just like stop <laughs> the possibility of intelligent life developing on Earth. But it's like we're already here. But they don't know that yet, and then we just can't. <laughs> yeah, it's like yeah, a preemptive then, then the, Reapers from Mass Effect, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then optimistically, maybe you know we could cooperate with another species. You know, yeah. if we occupy different niches, you know, like let's say it's a species that evolved in a gas planet on the atmosphere of a gas planet, so mm -hmm. their environment is so different than our environment. We're not necessarily competing for the same resources, yeah. at least to start. On, if if you go way way down the rabbit hole and say okay we're we're thousands and thousands of years down the timeline, everyone's competing for the same resources at that point. Everyone needs hydrogen. Everyone needs mass. Everyone needs all the mass you can energy you can get if you go down a long enough timeline. But um, if if you don't go extrapolate quite that far, then you can imagine we could have be peacefully coexisting with certain species. Mm. You've been bringing up some really interesting kind of like plot fuel kind of <laughs> things. Obviously, yeah. like relativ relativistic uh, uh, missile is like that. That's just like an that's like game over kind of scenario. But I'm curious if you have some other uh, concepts that, that you've come across and, and, and things that you find to be really intriguing story elements that aliens or first contact can lend to a story. I mean, well, so I always go back to first principles. Whenever, whenever I read a story where the aliens are completely incomprehensible, I, I take a step back and think, okay, we live on a planet with some really weird creatures on it. Like, mm -hmm. go look at some insects. Go look at some deep sea creatures. Octopi. We all, yeah, we all operate off the same basic requirements for energy, reproduction, uh, social contact if it's a social mm -hmm. species of some sort and you know people say well it's you know how would you even be able to communicate with this this completely other creature i can communicate with my dog <laughs> you know i can communicate with an a reptile to a degree you know i understand the basic stimuli that's going stimuli that's going on so i don't think that unless we're talking about aliens that are you know energy beings or something mm -hmm. that's just completely removed from the physical plane. So as long as they're part of the physical plane, as long as they're physical creatures, I think that we can understand those basic urges and requirements. And, and if you start talking about, you know, well, they're, they've uploaded their consciousness into machines and now we've got self-replicating robots out there that are filled with alien consciousness. Now that would be a challenge. But again, even then, they're going to protect their physical structures they're going to protect their means of energy they're going to search out more means of energy you know it's it's as heinlein heinlein said there ain't no such thing as a free lunch and everything mm -hmm. operates off that principle and all of it provides conflict for story all of it provides conflict and ultimately down the road the biggest one is energy everything needs energy yeah. and um if you go way way down the timeline you know the stars start burning out um energy is the core currency of life and you have mm -hmm. to preserve it as much as possible yeah yeah well and i kind of want to return which is oh go ahead which is why i'm such a big believer in getting off this planet because humans really need <laughs> more eggs and more baskets yes we're a bit so too voracious fair. for this earth that we call especially <laughs> considering how we've treated this particular basket yeah. <laughs> so well, put it put it this way. I actually had a, a Twitter argument about this recently. We know that the sun is going to boil off the oceans in about 3 billion years. And then in about 4 billion years, the sun expands to a point that it swallows up the earth. Yeah. So it is unlikely that any other intelligent species, self-aware species, will evolve on the earth in that time period if we go extinct. And because we've used all the easy forms of energy, we've gotten all the easy oil out of the ground it would be very hard for a new industrial civilization to evolve from, mm -hmm. from scratch. So odds are 
if we really care about the environment and we really care about the plants and animals and all of the special, unique creatures on this planet, the only hope they have for survival is humanity getting us off this planet. Let's get our shit together. Right? Well said. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If we don't get off the planet and then take the life on this planet off, even just to reproduce elsewhere, mm-hmm. it all disappears eventually. Right. It all and goes it won't away. Have and a I have a chance to evolve. Yeah. No, no, it won't. It's fascinating. There's so much you can dig into. And I feel like uh, <laughs> it's, it's scary to think of on that level, right? And that those timelines of billions of years. Um, but, uh, you know, they're like, we've been saying there's so much story fodder. There's so much, uh, that you can yeah. tell in there. Uh, but I want to return a little bit to something we discussed briefly in part one of our, of our interview series with you, um, about the nature, kind of like the recurring nature of, of stories and themes and things mm-hmm. like that. Um, and I'm curious, I have like a two part question. So first of all, are there any like tropes that you love to play with regarding aliens and first contact and what are some of your pet peeves of like alien stuff that you see in media um well i mean tropes i literally have aliens with tentacles in to sleep in a sea of stars <laughs> i i wanted to do straight up aliens with tentacles um and make them believable in in an interesting way in to sleep in a sea of stars uh I remember when I read uh, it was a, it was Burroughs uh, Edgar Rice Burroughs um, Mars novels, mm-hmm. and I realized that he literally created the stereotype of green aliens with little antenna ears. That's yeah. from his his books. Oh, yeah. Um, but a- anyway, so <laughs> I, I wanted to do tentacles, and as far as tropes, I mean, I think I what I was saying about um, aliens being completely incomprehensible or being unable to comprehend us. Mm. Um, only really makes sense to me if they're no longer material creatures. Uh, and then also when aliens are supposedly invading for our water or our iron or, you know, anything like that. No, that's all in space. <laughs> the only real reason they'd invade us would be to get us or the plants or animals. Yeah. We're going to come for all your, your elephants. Cause they can't <laughs> jump. That's right. They can't, they can't jump to have run away. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. I mean, anything? that's actually why um, it's, it's corny, but the Star Trek film, The Voyage Home, um, you know, the alien probe is coming to talk to the whales. That's actually a really interesting idea. Yeah. That's a that's interesting and makes a little more sense. Yeah. Or like in a Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy with like the the dolphins being like, yeah, we've actually been intelligent the whole time. And just yeah. like, peace out. Bye. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thanks for all the fish, everybody. <laughs> Thanks for all the fish. <laughs> I want to get into. We spoke about, uh, about emotion uh, in the in the last episode, but I, I want to get your take on the kinds of fears and fascinations and and emotional spectrum that that aliens and the idea of first contact can give us. You know, it's like we, you brought up this uh, notion of the unknown. Like the unknowable mm-hmm. is scary for people, not just with aliens, but it's like humans tend to freak out when things are unknowable mm. that's uh, why we're afraid they, of the dark right yeah exactly monsters yeah. under the bed so um what's alien your, what, <laughs> <laughs> aliens under the bed that's it yeah. <laughs> so what do you think about this notion of like fears and fascinations when it comes to uh aliens and like possibly intelligent species and how you can uh use these on the page to kind of like play upon a reader's viewer's psyche I mean, it's, it's a huge lever to move the emotions of the characters and the re and the readers. So, uh, you can't, it's hard to imagine a more cataclysmic event in terms of culture, possibly in terms of actual survival. Uh, I mean, you would, I would imagine, you know, every single religion would have to grapple with the existence of self-aware aliens. Every culture would have to decide, you know, how we were going to, interact with these creatures and of course if they were hostile that would only heighten the whole the whole process so um i would imagine it'd be the sort of thing where the 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 consequences would play out probably over the course of a couple centuries assuming we survived Mm -hmm. initial contact um it would take a long time for you know, all of the knock on effects to become apparent i mean just like we're seeing with technology and the internet i mean we we still have no idea uh, ultimately what the effect of all the technology is on our culture. I mean, it's massively yeah. changing it and we were only a couple decades into this. 
Yeah. Or like Wi-Fi signals, social media, all this stuff that is just like, oh, we have a visitor. I can't. Oh my, God, oh my gosh, purr. I can hear the purr. <laughs> Damn. Damn, that purr is loud. Kiara the cat. Oh, Beautiful. Kiara. Hi, Kiara. <laughs> we love fluffy visitors. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, it's like the, the implications of all these things. It's like my wife was telling me about how um, she was listening to a podcast. Uh, it's called Huberman Lab with uh, Andrew Huberman about he mm-hmm. was interviewing he was interviewing someone about the effects of things like bluetooth signals and and wi-fi on how it might affect the brain and 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 um and that kind of thing especially with kids and development and all that kind of stuff and the person that he was interviewing was like yeah even if you turn it off it doesn't do anything which is like <laughs> really <laughs> sad to think about he's like yeah your neighbor literally it's like you'd have to live in the middle of nowhere and turn off everything yeah. in order to not experience it but it's like if you had a wireless house like a like a wire uh, like a wireless free house and yeah. you turned everything off you would still get that signal from your neighbors from well no that's why you put lead in your walls and, and then you get lead poisoning <laughs> exactly <so. laughs> great, I mean, there great suggestion there, there is there is an another option to all of this or alternative to all of this too, which is there isn't alien life out there or it's so far away from us. We're never going to actually come into contact it with mm. it or, and I actually think this may be the slightly more likely one. There is quite a bit of life out there, but very rarely has it ever risen to sentience. Yep. So yep. we'll find planets with microbes and maybe mm-hmm. plants and fauna, flora and fauna, but maybe nothing sentient. Um, mm. I actually think there's a there's a good chance that humans are going to become our own aliens. Uh, we're developing the biological tech now to gene hack ourselves uh, in all sorts of wi- wild and wonderful ways, and mm-hmm. you just know what's going to happen once the furries get their hands on home gene hacking kits. <laughs> we just did an episode um, on animal companions, and it's like you can be the animal companion you if can- you want to. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> pretty dreams. much. And e- even if we just expand into the solar system for the time being. Uh, and for the time being, I mean, let's say the next thousand years. Yeah. Humans are probably going to speciate. Uh, True. And and that, I mean, you know, the Expanse kind of dealt with that a little bit with the Belters already. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, you know, you go a couple thousand years down the road with our with artificial tech, the distances involved, we could end up becoming our own aliens, um, which I think is a cool idea, um, a cool future to explore. I agree. And we're doing enough squabbling that we'd probably end up doing it more in the future. <laughs> yeah. just, Especially just when we destroy ourselves that. anyways. <laughs> yeah. Woo. Come on. Arguing is the thing that humans enjoy just as much, as much as getting along with each other. We, we enjoy both <laughs> just as much. That's, that's what Twitter has shown the us. The, yeah. the microcosm of Twitter. Twitter. Shown us? <laughs> <laughs> maybe not, maybe not like the, the like getting along thing so much. As right. Like yeah. The, the other side. Well, bullshit. speaking of not Twitter, uh, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> what a smooth Shoot. segue. Um, <laughs> I'm curious about your process for creating empathy in ca- alien species and characters. Cause we've talked a lot about the fear aspect, right? That it's the unknown yeah. and it's scary and it's a whole, you know, they're going to come kill us. Um, but I'm curious about the flip side. Um, your, your thoughts on that. I mean, I think it's the same as with any human character. You, you just have to, you have to give the readers a reason to care. Uh, so sometimes that's by showing what's important for the character. Uh, when you when you give a character something to care about, something to be passionate about, it means that they now have something that's at stake, mm, that's right. at risk, or or can be at risk over the course of the story. And if you do your job well, that can you know really make people care. Um, you know, there's a classic using a human example, like how do you, how do you humanize a villain? Well, yeah, he goes out and he robs banks and shoots people, but he's got a kitten at home that he cares for and brings milk. (laughs) And he call and he calls his mother who's 89 (laughs) in the nursing home and he calls her every evening. And, you know, so yeah, okay. He shoots people, but he's, you know, he calls his mother every night in the nursing home. Um, and then when he, you know, inevitably he gets confronted by the police and is about to get shot, then you feel bad for him because right. he's not going to be able to car- care for that kitten and who's going to call his mother, yeah. right? Yeah. It's the same thing for any creature. It's just degrees of how you go about establishing that empathy. Yeah. 
the poor the poor mother. She's probably the one who's encouraging him. <laughs> she's, she's on the phone every night. She's a bad influence on she's him. I'm telling influence. you. <laughs> Those octogenarians, you got to watch uh, out. <laughs> uh, they're just fucking bitter about society and life. <laughs> Go deal with it, son. Um, oh, Adrian. So we've, we, we've mentioned um, the fractal verse. We spoke about it in the last episode a bit more, but I want to kind of dive, dive deeper mm. into the aliens that you've created for the fractal verse. So when you were, you, you mentioned the tentacles, you wanted to do tentacles and I really like the jellies mm-hmm. and that's a great name. It makes them, it makes them feel more empathetic when they're called jellies <laughs> um, or the turtles in, in fractal noise. So how did you approach mm. the creation of, of alien species from like a, you know, biological level, but also like cultural and societal level. Mm. Was it important to you to kind of steer clear of the trope of like the bipedal humanoid alien, you know, with the green skin yeah, and like yeah. the little like antenna yeah. and stuff? Ab- absolutely. I mean, as far as naming them goes, uh, English going back to Anglo-Saxon has a wonderful tradition of naming things in the most obvious <laughs> in your face way. Like, like, we we call them butterflies, but that's not what the word originally was. The original word wasn't butterfly. It was flutter by. <laughs> and yeah. ling- linguists believe that some kid had trouble saying that and just went butterfly and everyone thought it was funny and just swapped the butterfly. Yeah. But, the thing is, but the thing is, so that's how cooler. we name things in sort of the Anglo-Saxon English tradition is, what is it? Just say it in the most direct way possible. Yeah, yeah. Um, so <laughs> my aliens kind of look like jellyfish, so we call them jellies. Um so I, I remember reading an article that was discussing the biology of um, octopus and the octopods and how in many ways they're the closest thing we have to aliens on the planet mm-hmm. because they diverged from our evolutionary chain so early in the process that the – excuse the imagery, but the cluster of cells that in humans becomes the mouth and the cluster that becomes the – not the mouth, the other end <laughs> is the anus. reversed. <laughs> not the mouth. <laughs> is reversed in the octopus. Oh. And not only that, their their trachea goes right through the center of their brain, which has three lobes, and oh. the arms of the octopus are semi-autonomous. Right. So I was looking at the octopus, and then I was looking at the, the reproductive uh, and life cycle of the jelly, various jellyfish, which can go from, you know... Uh, a free floating creature to a sessile rooted creature and and it's effectively biologically immortal and i kind of wanted to combine the octopus with the jellyfish in an alien creature and then thinking about what sort of psychology that would lead to what kind of structure um to the point where because they're effectively biologically immortal and they have this concept of semi-autonomous body parts in some ways they don't attach a lot of value to the individual or mm-hmm. to their own body because it's it's a it's a fungible mutable thing. Yeah. They also have access to some advanced tech that they didn't uh, invent that allows them to transfer consciousness from one body to another. It's the imprint of a consciousness, I should say. Um, uh, so that that was all really fascinating to think about, and I'm something i'm continuing to think about and will develop more in the future and then in fractal noise we have these creatures called turtles which uh, i really wanted to go hard on the idea of it being difficult for my characters to even tell if these creatures were alive Mm -hmm. are they are they biological are they mechanical what are their intentions what their motivations uh and it is one of those things i know i was ranting about um uh, incomprehensible aliens earlier. These aliens are incomprehensible <laughs> in the moment for my characters because they don't understand the inputs and pressures and, you know, they don't yeah. really know what's going on with these creatures in that moment. Right. Yeah. Whereas in, whereas in to sleep in a sea of stars, there's like, um, there's a larger progression in terms of the understanding yeah. between humans and jellies. And you learn more about their species as they interact together. Whereas I think fractal noise, it works that there's kind of this like incomprehensibility and everything is so alien and inexplicable and unknowable that it's like about the whole setting. Yeah. Yeah. About the setting, about this. (laughs) I mean, honestly, it is. The characters are very, uh, you know, it's like apocalypse. It's like literally out of their element. (laughs) Yeah. It's like apocalypse now where it's kind of this like journey into the unknown but it's also like the journey into the psyche of of yeah 
this character, Alex, and yeah. the people around him. Yeah. There, there's a Ray Bradbury short story that I, I can't remember the title of. I, I think I remember the title, but I don't want to butcher it, so I'm going to skip it. Um, but <laughs> he said it on Venus back when we thought Venus might be habitable. And mm. the characters are dealing with this rain that falls on them, and it never stops raining. And it it basically drives them insane, this constant <laughs> rain. Uh, and, and that was actually in the back of my head as I was writing Fractal Noise. Mm-hmm. The, these characters are dealing with the the physical effects of the planet they're on. Yeah. The, the short is story is called all summer in a day, which is a great name for a story set on Venus. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like just some fun acid rain. Sounds yeah. Like right. <laughs> Woo. <laughs> that is fascinating though. And I do think that, uh, fractal noise, um, captures that though, where it is, it's, it's very much a character study and it's almost because the setting is so, Alien. Oppressive. That's the only word I could think of. Yeah. yeah. It it almost is kind yeah. of like a, a bottle episode of these characters, right? Where the, so much of the story is about their interactions with one another and their attempted interactions with 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 aliens. So I'm curious about your approach to communication and just to dive into that. Striking that balance between successful first contact versus first contact gone nowhere. Does it count as first contact? I'm just curious about your approach there. <laughs> Uh, I mean, with fractal noise, I wasn't the the first contact that is occurring is really to facilitate what actually happens with the characters. So Mm -hmm. I was, um, it's funny you mentioned it it being a bottle episode because I was really very much thinking of a lot of the old classic sci-fi short stories and novels, which are more like novellas that I read growing up. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's where my brain was at with this book. So um, yeah, I mean, as far as the, the success or lack of success with the first contact <laughs> and fractal noise, well, and all, the thing is too, is how do I put this? Sometimes answers come too easily in stories and we like that because it gives us resolution at the end of the story. Mm-hmm. Uh, however, in this case, physically, there was no easy way for the characters to get the answers they were looking at. What they're investigating essentially is a site that needs to be studied for decades probably yeah. longer than decades and i really try i really did look at like could i do x could i do y are they going to find this are they going to find this and all of it felt cheap all of it felt like a cop out or you know something that doesn't fit the universe yeah. i'm building the answers they find are going to be available in the fractal verse mm-hmm. and readers will be shown those answers in the sequel to to sleep in a sea of stars so there's a little bit of a spoiler for you um, but the characters themselves don't find those answers here because that's not what this story is about. Yeah. Yeah. It's cause like, I, I, I really appreciate it when things don't necessarily get answered right away. Cause yeah. obviously, obviously some people are just like, I want it right now. Just give it to me. But then again, it's like for me as a lifetime reader of science fiction and, and fantasy and a writer and just really appreciating the craft element of this. I'm like, it's good when you can fuel people's imaginations and, and just kind of put them on this journey that, that is so, you know, like the conflict that comes up in fractal noise is so psychological and so internal. Mm. And, you know, it's also kind of this like, like uh, human versus environment kind of oppressive struggle. And, and I think that works really, yeah, exactly. It's (laughs) just like that thud, man. I want to read, I want, yeah. Like it would drive you crazy though. Would it not? It would drive you insane. Yeah. And you're like trying (laughs) to fall asleep and and just thud. God damn. Yeah. And and to be fair to folks who maybe haven't read the book, um, the main character, Alex does get the answer he's looking for. He gets the resolution he needs over the course of the story. Mm-hmm. So I don't want people to think that I'm completely leaving them hanging no. out oh, to dry. Yeah. You may feel that way on a couple of the questions, but <laughs> the, the the important point um, for for the main character, he does find an answer he that he can live with. Mm-hmm. And that yes. that was the reason I wrote the story. Well, yeah. and it's it's kind and, of what, but what you said about it. It's not the, a story that's the same structure as aragon or you know what i mean it's it's very exactly but in a beautiful way yeah thank you well and and 
this is probably telling too much about myself, but um, this story <laughs> is where my brain was when I finished the inheritance cycle. So right. if, if, if that tells you anything. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> and, and, and coming back to edit it was an interesting experience because I was like, I'm not this person anymore. Right. Um, my my brain isn't here. Um but uh, I'm glad I did it. And I, it, editing that story, uh, revising it, hit a lot harder now that I'm married. And if yeah. you've read Fractal Noise, you'll understand why. So it yeah. was it was hard to put myself that. Yeah. yeah, into the main character's mind and really just live with those emotions for six months of revisions. Yeah, crazy. And I imagine at the same time, it's because like you're seeing a past version of yourself which is kind of a trippy thing yeah. to be like, wow, I'm like reading old writing and then turning it into something that, that, that works and that you can put out into the world. And at the same time, it's like you're building out this whole interconnected universe of the fractal verse. And you mentioned yeah. in the last episode, the amount of research that you had to do. <laughs> so it's kind of like at the same time, it's like you're going back to see past Christopher. And then at the same time, it's like you're building up all this research to kind of flesh out the fractal verse. And I imagine during that process, it's like you're discovering a lot about yourself, but you're also discovering a lot of crazy shit, like about the world and physics oh, yeah. and, and the universe and everything. Was there something that that you came across that really changed your perspective on on what we think we know about the universe and our place in it or something that really, really blew your mind that you were like, Ooh. I had no idea this was a thing before you started going down that rabbit hole? I mean, I'm pretty... I've always kept up with science to a fair degree, so I, there wasn't any big thing that 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 had that effect on me. But there was something that had that effect on me, and it's it's hard to articulate. Um, the more I kept reading, the more I kept learning, the more I kept researching, and and because I was as a layman, as a as a layman who does not have a lot of mathematics under my belt, mm -hmm. so I was really struggling to wrap my brain around some very difficult advanced physics concepts and questions. But as I was doing this, I really, you know, what's that old saying? You know, if you stare long enough into the abyss, it, it starts looking back at you. Mm -hmm. And I really started to see and understand that there are some deep things we don't understand about the nature of reality. Mm hmm um, the fact that we don't understand gravity is a great example, um, that we haven't been able to reconcile quantum mechanics with classical mechanics. Um, there are cracks <laughs> that we don't quite know how to paper over or quite know how to dig in and understand at the moment. Um, and of course, the ultimate question of why is there something instead of nothing? What does nothing even mean? How do you mm -hmm. define nothing? Yeah. That's, yeah. that's actually a really hard question. Um, and that that really kind of I don't want to say it shook my faith in science, but you know when you look when you when you look over the history of science, at any point in science in the history of science, you can you can you'll find that the majority of people were convinced they had a good understanding of the nature of reality, yeah. and now we look back at them and we go, oh, those poor uneducated fools! They had yeah. no idea what <laughs> things actually were, and it's a little unsettling to realize that the same is probably true of us. Exactly, and we just don't know what the next answer is. Um, so that's that's frustrating in a way because i want those answers um and it's it's definitely made me think i don't want to say in more mystical terms but definitely in some more weird wishy weird ways about <laughs> how reality actually works on a very deep level it's kind of cool though because fiction can in a way bridge the gap between what we think we know about reality right now and what we could potentially unravel over the course of time yeah. and, and just being able to explore these different things based on what we know now and just speculating yeah. and, and letting your mind kind of flow a little bit as much as frustrating as it is as authors, it's like, we can kind of just say like, well, I'll just extrapolate and come up with some we stuff. We can just, just create <laughs> headcanons for the future of humanity. That's right. <laughs> we can choose well, to and believe we, them. <laughs> I can make elephants jump. Like, things are good. Everything That's right. Is fine. Well, we were talking last episode about how if you study plot and story structure long enough, you start thinking of stories in what the elements of a story symbolically represent versus mm -hmm. what they appear to be on the surface. And 
in some ways, the universe and reality is kind of like that as well. You know, there's some theories that the universe itself is essentially nothing but information, you know, and how that information is organized is what creates the impression of physical substance and reality around us. Mm-hmm. Stories also work on that on a symbolic level, on an information level. And so even though as a storyteller, we're probably storytellers, we're sometimes wildly inaccurate when it comes to how the world actually works. If we can get the symbolic reality correct the psychological reality right then you know it's you're able to communicate effectively and someone in the future can come back and still enjoy your story even though they say yeah they got xyz wrong or Mm -hmm. no this isn't how it actually works but you know what the underlying meaning and structure is good and it makes sense and i can enjoy it for that yeah it's like going back and reading bradbury and being like it doesn't matter that venus we know now the reality of it or like reading the martian chronicles and being like i wish (laughs) amazing (laughs) but you can appreciate it from a story level not necessarily from like a scientific accuracy level it's like that doesn't really matter at at that point it's like you can appreciate it for what it is based on the craft well and what it says about you know about human you know it's still communicating something about our our journey as as humans without even if it's not Mm -hmm. actually correct in the end (laughs) <laughs> excellent well i want to just I, we've we've gotten a lot of wonderful writing advice out of you and i am going to ask for one more piece uh just a f- final piece of writing advice you might have for a, a writer an author that's looking to incorporate aliens or some sort of first contact narrative mm. into their story do you have anything like that yeah i i'd say i'd say focus on the fundamentals like i was talking about earlier think about um where your aliens get their food where their energy comes from for us as a society, what their level of technology is. Um, even if you're giving them magic tech, you know, try to try to set some limits on it or understand mm-hmm. what those limits might be. And, you know, before you get too caught up in social theory or psychological theory or all of those things that uh, might drive how you want to present the aliens, try to understand their physical reality first, because that's going to drive a lot of how first contact would actually play out what the aliens might actually want or need um you know we are assuming we're talking about biological creatures we are biological creatures and that means that hormones have a big effect on us and Mm -hmm. our social structure has a big effect on us and that would be true of any biological alien as well Uh, and i think that often gets overlooked just for the sake of either spectacle or um you know pursuing a certain agenda independence that's day. such good advice it. though i love that to just start with the basics and build from there yeah yeah right, yeah well. I, I, it, it's it's silly to th- i mean it perhaps it's a little too basic to say but it really i mean our entire society is based off a couple of basic inputs in terms of technology mm-hmm. and once you understand that you can understand a lot more and i think the same would be true of, of any alien species yeah yeah that's fantastic. Awesome. All right. I love that. Well, that's a good way to close out with this mini masterclass and our two-parter with Christopher. Thank you again for taking the time to chat with us and nerd out about aliens and all this fun, uh, all this fun stuff, but also get like really philosophical and, and, and deep into the questions that like, you know, that drive us and, and, and fuel our emotions and, and everything like that. And um, yeah, I just really appreciate you, you taking the time and uh, sharing. My pleasure all the things that you've learned over the years. Um, <laughs> would you, uh, would you be able Thanks. to let folks know where they can find you on social media? Sure. Uh, on Twitter, I'm at Paulini, uh, Instagram. I'm Chris, Christopher underscore Paulini. Uh, and, uh, of course, P folks can find me at my website, Paulini.net, or if they're interested in the fractal verse at fractalverse.net. And of course, fractal noise is available wherever books are sold. And, um, Murtag, uh, my fantasy novel will be coming out later in the year and November 7th. So I encourage folks to check that out as well. Awesome. And yeah, go check out to sleep and see a stars. If you haven't read that already, the inheritance cycle, if you, you missed out on that, that if you somehow missed it, please read it it's <laughs> on, that, <great. laughs> on that era of fantasy. Um, but yeah, you can also follow SFF addicts on Instagram and Twitter at SFF addicts pod, or you can follow me at Adrian M Gibson, MJ, where can people find you? Yeah, you can find me across all the socials at MJCoon Books, all one word, and then MJCoon.com. Awesome. And Among Thieves, swearing. Yes, uh, and pre-order <laughs> Thick as Thieves. Come out in July. Thick as Let's thieves. go. Exactly. More swearing. 
Nice. July 25th. So you can get more thieves, more heists, all that fun stuff. And now keep reading, keep imagining, and we'll see you next time on SFF Addicts. <laughs>